John is, was baptizing Jesus in the water. And Jesus comes up out of the water. It's a gorgeous picture, one of the few times in the Bible we have. The Father speaking from heaven, Jesus in the water, the Holy Spirit descending. John recalls it as his eyes are open and he's watching the Son of God come out of the water and he's feeling completely like he doesn't measure up, like he shouldn't be the one doing this. Jesus should be baptizing him. He even tried to protest, but Jesus says, we have to fulfill everything that God requires. And so he's coming up out of the water and, and John is in the state of, how am I in this place, in this situation? How is this even happening? You can imagine, it was almost like, he must have felt like he was in the twilight zone or something. He's like, what is going on? I'm baptizing in water the Son of God. God from heaven unzipping himself from his divinity, putting himself into human form inside of the womb of a woman, growing nine months in the womb of a woman, coming out and then being raised and having to be taken care of, having to be fed, and then for 30 years, almost in an anonymity besides a couple scriptures we know about, and he's working as a carpenter, a normal job, paying his taxes like every one of us do, and then for three years all of a sudden this is the beginning of his breaking out into the most powerful ministry that in three and a half years what Jesus did was enough to fill the entire Bible to make the Bible about him and enough that we are still talking about it enough that in three and a half years he changed the entire world and his gospel is what we preach and John is sitting there saying my goodness as he came out of the water the Bible says he broke through the water in the Greek the word is he tore out of the water tore out of of the water and when he tore out of the water the words are that in the heavens it rent it ripped open and then God spoke and the Holy Spirit came through you see as Jesus was tearing out of the water physically the heavens were ripping open tearing open and then the Holy Spirit descended through that you see it was a foreshadow of when Jesus would hang on the cross and when he would hang on the cross and the moment he said it is finished the Bible says the moment he gave up his spirit into heaven the veil in the temple tore in half and then now the Holy Spirit is not just available to Jesus only but the Holy Spirit ripped through our own boundaries and all the things that we had placed in front of him and the way that only a priest one time a year could go in now he rips out of our containments and our boxes and he says now I'm available for every single one of you I'm coming for you I'm coming for your house I'm coming for every one of you and he comes into that place and he rips through all the things and it says John is witnessing this and he says this amazing picture he says I saw the Spirit of God God's in the water but God's in heaven but now God's coming towards me God's in the water God's in heaven but now God is coming towards me and he says he was like a dove we know that the Holy Spirit isn't a winged creature but he's saying the best way I could describe the gracefulness the way it's coming the way way it looks is it, it was like a dove was coming down and listen to these amazing words it says and the dove descended upon him and he said John said I saw it with my own eyes the dove came upon this man God who just ripped out of the water I don't know why I'm in this place and having the ability to do this but he didn't just come upon him. He said, I saw him remain. Those words and remain have been tearing me up for the last two years. You see, he remained not just at that point for the rest of that day. But he remained on Jesus the whole time he was on earth. Not one time did Jesus do anything, not one time, that would offend or grieve the Holy Spirit that he had to leave. Man. Second Corinthians 3.17, I'll return to that in just a second, that thought, but I want to get one more scripture and then we're just going to pray one more time. 3.17, we've heard this scripture many, many times. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Anybody say amen. Lord, we love you, God. We worship you today. You reign, Jesus, forever. You're amazing. God, you're awesome, Lord. I thank you. You're already beginning to touch hearts right now. Jesus, we submit our bodies to you, our hands, our feet, our, our it, it, sick bodies in this place, Lord. Come under the power and authority of the Spirit of God right now. 
We thank you, God, that any disease is God. Come under the authority and power of the Spirit of God right now. We thank you that people who are in this building, all the things and distractions and weights and pressures will be severed in this place because, Lord, in your presence, when your spirit begins to move, he always has everything we need. We worship you ahead of time. We thank you for being here. Holy Spirit, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. You see, Jesus walked all of this time and he was aware of something. Does anybody have a small cloth or a towel or something? I think a small cloth or a towel, anything I could get. Just something. It'd be great. Give me an altar thing where people like throw it over them when they fall. I could do one of those. It's fine. Sorry, I didn't think about it till now. Jess, you're awesome. Thank you. Get this picture here. This is so powerful. Oh, purple. The color of majesty. <laughs> so, Jesus, think about this. The Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove and remains. The Holy Spirit is upon him, never having to leave. Not one thing did Jesus do did he grieve him in order to leave. Can you see the picture of Jesus now from that moment after he comes out of the water, the spirit de descends upon him. The spirit then is in control the moment he comes upon him. Even though he's God completely, he's also 100% man and he shows what a man can do, the potential of a man from that moment on, completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's giving us an example of what a man or woman can do, completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. And you see the Holy Spirit takes control the moment he shows up. What's the next thing that happened? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, controls and drives him. The word in Greek is drives him into the desert. He takes authority when he's in the water. The Holy Spirit comes because, listen, the Holy Spirit always is the boss. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't have another role. He only has the role of the boss. Jesus knows this role because he's, uh, even, though, even though he's God, even though this is, this, is, this is an incredible mystery, obviously, right? The three in one, the Trinity, the one God, the three persons. It's amazing. It's beautiful. We believe it because the Bible says it, and it's a gorgeous thing. But we're seeing all three personalities right now. And it says that the Holy Spirit comes upon him and automatically takes the role of the boss. And Jesus does not question it. Jesus does not ever go against it. Jesus does not ever come up and say, wait a second, what are you talking about? I'm going to the desert. Listen, I'm God. <laughs> Let me have a say in this as well. No, he didn't. No, he allows the Holy Spirit to take control. And said he drives him into the desert. Can you imagine the awareness that Jesus had all the time of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you this question. What would it be like if we walked always aware of the dove? You know, the dove is one of the most flightiest of all birds. It's, it's extremely easy to scare away. It's, it's very skittish. It's, it's very, very, you have to be extremely gentle, very slow moving, very careful. You see, Jesus walked around always aware of it. You see, his speech was always being careful of the dove. When he walked around, when he touched people, he was always aware of if the dove wanted him to touch or if the dove wanted him not to. He was always aware of if the dove gave him the ability to rebuke or if the dove told him, keep your mouth shut. He said he did nothing unless the Father in heaven told him to. He didn't, he didn't extend his hand unless it was the Father doing it through him, through instruction of the Holy Spirit. You see, what was going on? The Father was speaking, the Holy Spirit, it was in his ear, and the Holy Spirit was giving the instructions to the man God, the God man, the man who was also God in flesh. But he was showing you and I an example of what a man, a person completely under the control of the Holy Spirit can do in three and a half years. The potential 
in three and a half years what was done of someone fully surrendered their hands, someone fully surrendering their feet, someone fully surrendering their mouth, someone fully surrendering their ears, their mind, to the total control and ownership, the boss of the Holy Spirit. And it said he walked around completely aware. What would it be like if you and I walked around, our families aware of the dove? How would you walk different? You know what you do? We would walk slowly, right? We'd, we'd be, if, if I had a dove here right now, I'd, I'd be walking slowly. I'd, I'd be sitting here. I'd be, I'd be careful. I wouldn't want to scare anything away. I wouldn't be shouting. I wouldn't be screaming. I wouldn't, nothing would happen. I wouldn't want anything to, 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 to make it fly away, right? I would constantly be in a position where I was aware of what was upon me. Get what I'm saying? I'd be aware of what is upon me. You see, there is a substance that's deposited upon us every time we come into God's presence. There is a substance when we were saved that came in us. It's not just a substance, it's a person. His name is the Holy Spirit. But there was a separate instance that happened where not only did the Holy Spirit come inside of you when you were saved, He comes upon you when you were baptized in His power. And when he comes upon you, he's not just there any longer to just guide you and to, to, to heal you in the inner way. He's there because he came in power so that you could be equipped to do something outside of yourself. You see, Christianity today, sadly, in many churches, the epitome of the Christian walk is to go to a good church, to make sure you are a tither, to be a blessing in your own house, to hopefully have a family that all wants to serve God as well, and to live out your days with a good job, hopefully nothing terrible happens. That is the epitome of what the Christian walk is now in the American church. Do you understand that that is a waste of the Holy Spirit inside of you and his substance that he has for you? The Great Commission, which is the only commission that Jesus gives the authority to support. It's not your commission. It's not your boss's commission. It's not a church's commission. It's not some other man's commission. The Holy Spirit is not equipped to empower that commission. He's only equipped to empower the commission Jesus gave. Which is to go out... Make disciples, teaching them to obey my words and to follow everything I have said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these signs will follow those who believe. They will heal the sick. They will cast out devils. They will raise the dead. When they drink poisonous drinks, it will not affect them. When they're bitten by venomous snakes, in other words, the dangers of the world around us, if they believe in who I am, will not affect and touch them. He says, that's the gospel the Holy Spirit came to support. There's no other gospel. There's no other message. And churches all over the United States, especially, have created their own versions of what the commission is, their own versions of what this gospel is, and the Holy Spirit is not having it. And you know, this is why churches will struggle. This is why our ministries will struggle. It's not because we're just dealing with people. People think that's the issue. Uh, amen. It, you know, people. People, you know, we're dealing with people. It's going to be messy. Yeah, I agree. I agree in a certain instance and all that. But here's the thing, y'all. All the people in the Bible dealt with people too. What do you think they were dealing with? Aliens? Animals? <laughs> you know, they, everybody was dealing with people. So we, we know that's, that's, well, that's who Jesus came to die for. So you're going to have people. Okay. So once we get over that, let's stop making that the only issue and excuse. Let's say this. Jesus gives authority behind you if you are representing his message, not your own. That's the basics, okay? The safest place to be is inside of the will of God. Can, you, can I say that again? The safest place in your life to be is not behind a barricade of policemen. It's not inside of a hospital wearing five masks on your face. I'm not against it if you're wearing a mask. It is not inside. It's not. That's not the safest place to be. It doesn't matter how much you incubate yourself in any way possible from the things of this world. You are no safer ever than inside of the will of God in your life. 
The will of God itself, the actual essence of God's will, being in God's will, is literally created with its own system of defense. That's what he just said. If you're in my will, snakes will bite you like Paul, but you just shake them off. If you're in my will, you'll drink things because somebody thinks they could sneak something in you to drink to kill you. You didn't even see it, but I saw it. And because you're in my will, I'll I have your back. You'll say something and I won't let it fall to the ground. I won't let you be embarrassed when you represent my gospel because it's not yours. And as long as you know it's not yours, you're not going to try to do your own will in your business, your own will in your family, your own will in your church. Therefore, I'm going to back it up. And when I come in the room, do you see, we are wasting so much strength and effort in our lives trying to do things that are not his message. And even though he loves us, even though he, he wants us to prosper, and even though he continues to work with us, his patience is amazing. His mercy is, is, is limitless. It's incredible. Of course, he's the most loving, amazing God ever. We are wasting so much energy. We're wasting so much strength trying to do something that he already gave us the recipe to say, you could have the blessed life. You could have the life. You, I will protect all these things you don't have to get more insurance policies you ain't got to get more of a, like you just got to be in my will do you know what my will is for your life once you find it your family's safe once you find it your marriage is safe doesn't mean there's not going to be attacks but guess what attacks are supposed to come because the devil wouldn't be much of a devil if he didn't try to attack something that's destroying his kingdom so yeah, tax are going to come. Of course they are. It's supposed to. If you ain't having any attacks or stuff going on, dear God, like, what's happening? You sitting there watching. Have you watched all of Netflix? Have you watched the entire app? The app is complete. Is that what you've been doing? I mean, what else are we doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, these days, so. 2 Corinthians 3.17 we're aware now, there's this, there's this presence, this substance. He's so aware of the substance on him. Get this, a woman comes with the issue of blood. She comes with the issue of blood. She sneaks up behind him. The Bible says many people were rubbing against him and touching him, just trying to get healed, just trying. Jesus traveled nowhere, it is said, theologians believe, with no less than three to 5,000 people following him through every city and every place he went. You notice many times in the Gospels where it says that Jesus is trying to get away from them to just go and pray by himself. But once they see where he's going, they would run all the way around. He gets on a boat and they're like, I think he's going to be over there. So they all run all the way to where he's going to be. He couldn't get away. The only times the Bible says Jesus could really pray was late, late at night, two, three, four in the morning. And we notice many times he is praying at that time, which makes sense because he's found napping on the boat during the day. Why? Well, he's praying all night. He's a man. He's got to sleep sometimes. So he's napping in the midst of a storm that everybody else is freaking out about, right? Because Jesus walks on the things that you and I drowned in. So never forget that. He walks on the stuff that we drowned in. So anyway, he, he's sitting there and and Jesus is so aware of what's going that this woman touches the hem of his garment but she touches it differently than everybody else touches it. She touches it with this faith, with this expectancy. She says, if I just touch him, I know something's about to happen. You see, there's something that happened in her mind. There was something different than people are like, let's see if this works. Uh, I don't know. You know, rubbing. And then somebody who says, oh, my God, I'm, that's the son of God. That, he's, he's the Messiah. That's somebody there. If I just can get to him, I know. You see, I know I'm going to be healed. You see, her expectation created the breeding ground for what she was about to draw. Do you get it? Her belief already created. It created what she was going to draw. Uh, it's there for everybody, but not everybody expects it to work. Not everybody truly believes it's going to work. People are just testing it out. People are just, let's see if this church thing works. They're not dedicated to it. Let's see if this healing thing works. I'll try it one time, and if Jesus does it, I guess I'll believe. But if not, pff, healing's not for everybody. You know, I'm going to try this thing out. Let's just test the waters. No, 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 no. She said, I know that I know. And see, when there's something that happens in your heart, you partner with God in belief and faith. She comes and she touches it differently. So what happens? She touches it, and he immediately stops. Because Jesus was so aware of the substance that was on him that even when a small withdrawal was taken... 
he felt the deposit go out of his account. Peter's walking around, y'all, and depending on the time of day, his shadow is longer than other times of day. So if it, the sun would have been going down, his shadow would have been all the way back through the wall. And anybody who got under his shadow was beginning to be healed. What's going on? He was realizing there's a substance that's on me. And he didn't just realize it. It was so apparent to everyone that even the political people, the political structure, the, the, the people that are around him all knew it to the point of they said, Peter's going to be walking down this street street always between 12 and 2 o'clock and if we'll just get people in the midst of the road before he gets there just lay him on the side of the road because even if he doesn't have time to talk to him there's something that's on him there's a substance that he's carrying that if we'll just get him in the path then his shadow might just come across him and if it does they're going to get healed do you understand that there is a substance we are carrying but are we aware of it and here's the thing, the substance is not potent when the man, the person, the Holy Spirit is not in charge. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a lot of people who have the Holy Spirit. He's in their lives. He's in their hearts. They enjoy it when they're in worship. They're great when they come to church. They love the whole experience. Man, for the, for the you know, hour and 15 minutes they have in church, they're like, man, this is amazing. God, you reign. You reign forever. His name is Jesus. You're the ruler of everything. You're amazing. They agree with that. Oh, for the time they're here, absolutely 100%, 100%, because this is God's house. So, you know, we're all like, well, in God's house, yeah, absolutely, okay. But then we get out of it and we go through the Monday through Saturday, all of a sudden we're like, man, I reign. I rule my business. I don't seek God about it. I rule it. I built this thing from the ground up. I did this. This is my family. These are my kids. Let me tell you something about heaven. How many of y'all excited to go there? <laughs> right? It's our home, right? It's amazing. Do you ever notice when it talks about heaven, the amazing things it describes heaven like? What does it say? There's going to be no what? Weeping. How many excited for that? You don't got to cry about crazy stuff. <laughs> no anxiety attacks. Hallelujah. Can anybody say amen? Right? No depression. Anybody ever been through depression? Aren't you going to be so excited? It will never touch you again. That's a spirit, man. Right? There's going to be no sickness. Anybody have a sick body? It's like, oh, Lord, you've ever dealt with some sickness? You, this body of yours, right? <laughs> you might have looked back on your life and been like, man, this body of mine, dear Jesus, I'm just glad it's making it through. But this thing's giving me so much trouble. Anybody ever said that before? Right? Uh-huh. In heaven, nothing. No sickness. None of that. Every, do you know why heaven works that way? Because there's only one person on the throne. There's not 200. He doesn't share the throne with anyone. And when only one person is on the throne, there's a clarity to the structure of how heaven works, the economy of heaven. Everything works because one person is the boss. And under his rulership, these are the evidences you have. That's why Jesus stood up and prayed. He said, dear God, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it's already working up there. I know how it works up there, God, and my desire, Father, would be that it would work down here like it works up there. That they would just have one person on the throne of their heart, God. You gave them the Holy Spirit, the one person that they get off the throne, they give it to him. 2 Corinthians 3.17, we read it, for the spirit, the Lord is a spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Listen to this real quick. I've read this scripture so many times, I'm sure many of you have heard it. However, this scripture has always bothered me, to be honest. And the reason why it's always bothered me is because if this were true the way that it's written, which I've always accepted it as truth because it's the word, then I've been in so many scenarios where the spirit of God was present. He was there, but not everybody was free. And it said, wherever he is, there's freedom. And I'm just, I've always struggled. I've believed it. I've chosen because it's the word of God. But I'm like, Lord, I've seen places where I've been, say, in church. I've been outside of church too, but in church. And, and I'll look right here in this couple. This man's being completely touched. But two people down from him, nothing. Doesn't care. Hates to be there. They're being touched. 
two rows back, doesn't care, hates to be there. Nothing. I mean, Jesus is all over the building. The Holy Spirit is obviously touching people everywhere, but not everybody's free. I thought that if he was there, wherever he is, he's here, but not everybody's free. What's, what's going on? And then I found out, finally after studying deeper, very few instances, but this is one of the ones that's a big one. When the Bible was translated into English, in this scripture, a comma was moved and two words flipped. So I'm looking and I'm saying, what does it actually say? Here it is. Wherever the spirit is Lord, there is freedom. Wherever the spirit is Lord is what it is. There is freedom. All of a sudden it came alive in my mind. I said, oh, okay. They've made the Lord. They've made him the ruler. They've made him this place right now. In this instance, they gave everything. This person, he's not welcome. They've made him well. Wherever he's Lord, whatever church he's made the boss, freedom's about to break out. Wherever business he's made the CEO, you might have the title, but you know you're not the real boss. If you're smart. You see, the biggest issue with churches, honestly, one of the biggest ones I go to, and I can't say this to all pastors or anybody else, but I grieve inside because they think it's really their church. Man, it's an issue. Because as long as you think it's your church, guess what you're going to go by? Your agenda. And when you go by your agenda, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit doesn't have room to be in there. And when the Holy Spirit doesn't have room to be in there, what are you not going to get? All the signs that follow those who believe. And when you didn't, don't get all the signs that follow those who believe. What gospel are you preaching? A distorted version of the gospel, not his. You know why you have to have the signs? You know why you have to have the miracles, the signs, the deliverance, all that? It's because if you show up to court and you say a message and you do not present evidence, are they going to take your case? We're trying to tell the kingdom of hell, this is our message, get out of the way. Where's the evidence is what they're saying back to us. They don't just move aside for any message because you are a charismatic person. Because you got a great personality. They move aside for the one message that was out first out of the mouth of Jesus himself that we now carry in our mouths and say again. Do you really think you own your business? Really? Yeah, I worked, my, I worked my behind off. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. We'll get to it. I promise the word's got something to say to you today. You really think just because you had those children, they're yours? Oh, gosh. Let's continue. Wherever he's Lord, y'all, today God's going to do something. I'm telling you, he's going to shift somebody's heart. Something's about to happen in this building, and he's about to take over. He's already here. I feel him right here. He's standing right here next to me. He's already speaking to some of you. But in second, you're going to open up your heart. You're going to release him to do what he wants to do. And I'm telling you, outside of this building, your life will be changed after today. If you receive the word that I'm sending your way, these are seeds. Is your heart open to the seed? Or is your heart already hardened? If it is, you're going to leave the same today. But remember, if you have soil that's ready to receive, I'm not telling you my thing. I'm giving you the scripture of God, the Bible. It is there for you. God loves you so much and he wants so much in your life. But you are the only one who can take the potential and capacity of the miraculous, beautiful power of God in your own life. You can tamper it. You can put it in a box. Remember, Jesus came to his own hometown and remember what happened. He could not could not do many miracles there. It's not that he didn't want to. Jesus, even as powerful as he was, is only restrained by one thing. When your perception of him and your unbelief abort what he wants to do. But I'm telling you, I've sent some hungry hearts in here. I sent some people who really, you've been praying for family members who haven't been saved and you're ready for them to get saved. 
I've seen people in here, you've been sick long enough and you're like, God, I've prayed so many times and I'm ready for this to happen. I know people in here, you're saying, God, I've been asking what to do with my life and I've been trying my best, but I need clarity on what you're saying. It's going to happen for you today. But it all requires one simple shift, not 15, not 20 different things. I could give you 20 steps to this and 15 steps to that. But I'm telling you, if you'll just shift the one main thing, get off the throne Put him on it. I promise things will line up. Zechariah 4, 6. Then he said to me, beautiful. This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force. Come on. It's not by strength, but it's by my spirit. What is he saying? Zechariah is about to go. He's prophesying to all of the armies. And he said, listen, I know you're about to do this. You're outnumbered. You're in a situation where it's way above yourself. But remember, it's never been about you. <laughs> he said, remember, it's not about you. It's not about all the force. Don't add more soldiers. That doesn't matter. Give them what you got. Don't, you don't got to get 15,000 more chariots. You don't have to have any more of this stuff. You ain't got to try to manufacture this in your own strength because it was never about your strength. It was never about your might anyway. It's about my power. It's about the Holy Ghost power. It's about if you know how to surrender or not. And that's the question of the Christian walk. Yes, you're saved. Yes, I, I believe you're going to heaven, 100%. But do you know how to surrender on this earth or not? That's what's going to judge whether we get to heaven and we get in front of the throne of God. And he opens the book, the Bible says, in Psalm 139. There is a book that the Lord has already written every single one of our days. He's written it in his book before we ever lived them. Now that book, uh, not, as many people might think, oh, that book's the book that like, I'll just live my life, I'll get to heaven. And then he's going to open it and say, see, you know, when you failed here and you did all that, it was already all there. See, I knew it. That's not the book. The book is as if you were walking according to his will he made before you were in his mother's womb. In other words, you are writing your own book. God already has a book he wrote. He will compare the two books when you get in heaven. And he will judge whether your book matches his. And anything in your book that doesn't match his, he burns up. The way that we know we're going to get there, the way that we know we're going to be in God's will, is we got to have one ruler. It said it's not by your strength anyway. It's not by your power. It's by the Holy Ghost. It's by the Spirit of God. You see, if you would have been out there with the disciples, can you imagine being on the water? You imagine, with, and you're seeing the storm go, and you feel like you're about to die. <laughs> and you're going back, you're like, oh, we're going to die. And Jesus isn't with you because he wanted to go and pray on some hill, and you're looking around for him, and it's getting so foggy and murky, and what's going on, and you, you're afraid you're going to die, and then all of a sudden you look out, and it looks like a ghost is on the water. Somebody's walking on the water towards you, and oh, you scream, as we all would. We're freaked out. What is going on? <laughs> Why? You know, and, and, and he goes, no, 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 no. He doesn't say what most scripture says, once again, where it says, it is I, don't be afraid. That's not what it actually says. The original Greek, you know, all he says, I am. So he doesn't come and he goes, you know, hey, uh, you know, it is I, don't be afraid. No, no, no. He just says, I am. And they all knew that's him. And because the I am spoke, one of the disciples named Peter says, if that's the I am, tell me to come out there. Because the I am can do anything. And he says, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, come on out. What do you say? Come. In the English language, four letters. Come. Do you understand Peter did not walk on water? Please, let's get that clear. He did not walk on water that day. He walked on a word. When you catch that, it's going to change your life. He did not need to walk on water. He walked on the word. The word changed the molecular structure of water and made it walkable. The word out of his mouth? No. The word out of Jesus's mouth why because the mouth of Jesus held the only voice that the universe is tuned to you know when you get with a symphony right you're going and somebody right they're all there have you ever seen the conductor he's he's doing the baton and he gets one person who makes sure they're on tune and they play a certain note and then all the rest of everybody tunes to that note so everybody's on the same page. Well, the greatest conductor, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, were all there in the beginning. The Spirit's hovering above the water, and God says, let there be light. 
And God says, let there be birds. And God says, and when the Father said it, it went through the Word, who is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit manifested everything the Father said that went through the Word. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is the finger of God. So he put the stars, literally, he held the stars. He is the finger. The finger of God put the stars in place. The Bible says in Job that he took the universe and he hung the world. He looked at nothing and he hung the world on the nothing. He saw this. This is air. There's nothing in front of me. I'm waving my hands. I know there's air there, but I could get it and I could take the world and just hang it there. Because for you, it's nothing, but nothing for God is always something. So he goes and the Holy Spirit was there. So the I am says come out. So the voice that was spoken that made everything happen. Remember the imprint, the tuning fork, the sound of the resonance is in the trees of his voice. The sound of the resonance is in the water of his voice. The sound of the resonance is in every animal. That's why they never have to go against what God says. That's why they never have to sin. Because they're only doing what thousands of years ago that first voice told them to do. And from that moment moment on they've never shifted from the resonance of that tune only we have the free will in order to do it we get off we get off the tone but the water knows his voice so he spoke and he said come and then the water listened and then as Peter was stepping out the molecules were talking to each other and the molecules spoke to this one that molecule said to that one hey hey, hey come together come come, 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 come. His, his foot's coming his foot's coming hey come you got to solidify you got to solidify boom and then there's one right there the next, the water's up there. It's coming. Oh, yeah, I think it's going to stop right here. So they're speaking together. Molecules are talking to the H2O. It's going crazy. But I get, boom. Because they know that voice. They can't resist the voice. You remember when Jesus is in the boat and he goes out with Peter and all the disciples and they've been fishing all night, caught nothing. And then he gets in and he said, cast it on the other side. And Peter's like, oh, really? Lord, we're pretty tired. <laughs> We've been doing this all night. We're the professional fishermen. You're good with people, but like we do fish. However, at your word, we'll do it. Peter didn't know it. He just did it because it was at his word. Smart choice, Peter. Why? Because the moment he, Jesus said it, every fish, every whale, every shark, Every animal in the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, every body of water was headed for that net. Those fish were just happened to be the first ones who got there. Because the voice spoke. Oh, man. You see, all you need is a word, y'all. I'm not just saying that. Do you understand all you need is a word from God about where you're at in your life right now? Because it can solidify things that you drowned in. You'll walk on them tomorrow if you got a word. The things that are causing anxiety attacks for you right now, if you get a word from God, you'll sleep in peace and never have another anxiety attack. He says, and he walks out. Do you think it would have changed you? Do you think it would have changed you to see Peter walking out there? Do you think it would have changed you to see all this happening? How about when he goes down and he's coming off the Sermon on the Mount and he touches the leper and immediately, remember, he touches the leper. Nobody touches lepers. I love it that this one specifically, the scripture says, he reached out and touched him. You see, he made it a fact to put it in the Bible. Make sure you do not miss this. I touched him because everybody catches the disease of leprosy, the most, it's the most lethal, it's the most contagious, way more than COVID-19 or anything else. And way more contagious, nobody touches him, no priest touched him, no nothing. But you know what happened? Jesus didn't catch what the man had, the man caught what Jesus had. He touches him, he makes sure, he says, I'm going to go ahead and just lay hands on what everybody else is afraid of. <laughs> Woo! Why? Because I'm the one who created this body. I know how it works. I'm the original mechanic. If your car has issues, who do you take it to? You might try to watch a lot of YouTube videos and figure it out yourself, and every once in a while, maybe you're good, right? Hey, and you feel pretty cool as a man or a woman. You're like, yeah, <laughs> I fix my own ride now. You know, I put in my own brakes. You know, maybe it makes you feel amazing. Awesome, keep going for it because they'll rip you off a lot of places. But you go back to the mechanic. The person who made and manufactured the car, right? 
who made and manufactured your body, then why in the world? Thank God. Hey, doctors are amazing. God uses doctors. God uses the miracle power of doctors. God uses medicines. I totally believe 100% all that. But I'm telling you this. Have you gone back to the original designer? You know, he's got millions of body parts floating around up there. You got issues with your knees? I guarantee he's got a few billion. You got issues with your ankles? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you think it would have changed you to see all that? If you say yes, I'm sorry to inform you, you're lying. Because even the disciples, after seeing all of this, when it came down to him being arrested, what did they do? They ran for their lives. They deserted him. When it really mattered, Peter denied him, even though he promised, I will never deny you. What happened? The pressure came on him. The test came on him. Three different times he denies him. Why? Because even if you see the miracles, but the Holy Spirit doesn't touch you, you can't be changed. Even if you hear the words, but the Holy Spirit doesn't touch you, the words don't sink deep even if you're in this situation do you understand acts chapter 2 hadn't happened yet so every listen to, never forget this every sermon that jesus preached when he was alive no person could perform or follow it every single sermon he said nobody who heard him was able to do it until acts chapter 2 happened Because the Holy Spirit, without him, you can't even understand the word. Do you notice the disciples, even though they're his disciples, are constantly getting him in a back room saying, what the heck did you mean by that? They didn't have the teacher. They didn't have the one who said, I will teach you all things. Jessica said it this morning. I will show and teach you all things. If you don't got the teacher, how do you expect to understand what is in this book? Do you go to class? Do you go and get a lecture and you see the textbook when you show up to class and you're like, wow, we're going to be tested out of that textbook. We're going to be quizzed out of that textbook. All of it's going to happen out of this book right here, but the teacher never shows up. What are you going to do? Panic. Because the test's still going to happen. The quiz is still going to happen, but nobody's there to explain. You're going to do your best. Oh my gosh. Hundreds of pages. That's what we do every day when we get up and we have our devotions without inviting the Holy Ghost. That's what we do every single time we go to church and we just expect we'll just know the word without inviting the Holy Spirit. If the teacher doesn't show up to the classroom, you're not going to understand when you have questions. Every time you open the word, you got to invite the Holy Ghost before you open the Bible. Say, so Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. I'm the student. Help me see Jesus in this book. Help me see you, God. What are you trying to say? Holy Spirit, I need your help. Every time. But I did that like a couple weeks ago. Doesn't he already know that I need his help? Yes, but here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is such a gentleman. I'm telling you, y'all, unless you invite him, he never barges into your life. And when you go to sleep, you're going to have to do it the next morning. And then you're going to have to do it the next morning. You've got to invite him every day because he will never assume his dominance. And here's the incredible thing about God. This shocks me. Do you know any other owner? And I'm about to prove all the things he owns in your life. But do you know any other owner who does not demand the property that he owns? I'm about to show you how he owns everything in your life. But he does not demand it. He wants you to give it willingly. What a God. What a God. You might think real quick, your plans are pretty good right now. You're like, man, you know, Gavin, this is interesting. <laughs> this is good. I'm, I'm feeling something from it. I, you know, I could let him in maybe here and here and here, you know, but I got some good plans. My wife and I, we had our five-year combo at the end of this, uh, at the beginning of this year. You know, we have our five-year plan, you know, financially. We took the uh, Financial Peace University. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, Dave Ramsey really helped us out, you know. Right? So, praise God. All of that's good. But let me tell you, your plans versus God's plans. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 through 25. Let the word of God speak to you. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 through 25. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Here it is. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Let me put it in layman's term. 
your greatest idea is God's dumbest. <laughs> the strongest you could ever get is even weaker than God could ever try to get. <laughs> Maybe you had great plans and you've worked on your plans and you think you've had a pretty good life. Read that. What kind of life could you have? You think that's good? Jesus says in Ephesians 3.20, we all know it, I'll do exceedingly above and beyond all you could ever ask. That touched somebody. Somebody, when I just said that, you've already, God's been speaking to you this word, this verse. I felt it go out into the atmosphere. I'm telling you, when that hits you like that, and I just confirm, the Holy Spirit is about to do a quick work. I will do exceedingly above and beyond all you could ask or think or imagine. Now, please understand why he's able to say that. God can never speak anything that's a theory. Do we get that? He can only speak truth. He doesn't try to speak the truth. He is the truth. Do you understand? It's not something he doesn't try not to lie. He cannot lie. Do you understand? So for God to speak something, it cannot be theory true. It has to be tested, proven truth. Well, how could God test that if it's in the future? Because God is already completely in the future. Watch this. He went to the end of all of time and he watched what every single person of the human race before he comes back, before Jesus comes back, every single person, what they would ever ask, what they would ever think or what they would ever imagine without him. He listened to all of them and he said, I can do better than all of it. Therefore, I say, I can do exceedingly above and beyond. I can ask that he went to the end of time, made sure it was proven, said it. <laughs> I don't want to go deeper on that, but man, God has a different perspective than we do, y'all. So Jesus says here, and I'm going to go quick here, and then we're going to start ministering. Jesus says here, Luke 6, 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Watch this. Jesus, they're calling him Lord. We call him Lord. We lift you up, Lord. We love you, Lord. Lord means, in the Greek, mighty owner. Mighty owner. So Jesus looks at me and says, listen, okay, you call me Lord. So you're saying I'm the owner of all the things in your life. So I'm going to ask this from your life, but then you say no. You said I'm the owner. When I ask for what I own, you say no. Why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? I'm not the owner. What's the facade we have here? Why is this pretense up? Let's be honest. That's what Jesus says. You know the reason why they didn't want him to do it? Because the moment they called him Lord, he did something that was out of the box. Mark 5, 17. They didn't like what he did. They're like, you're Lord until you do something we're not comfortable with. <laughs> right? So Mark 5, 17, watch this. And they began to pray for him to depart off their coast. What happened? Really quickly, Jesus steps onto the coast. The demoniac comes toward him. He'd been trying to, you know, cutting himself. 6,000 demons, around 6,000 demons inside of him. Jesus says, you're going to go into the pigs, cast them into the pigs. They run off the edge of the cliff. They drown themselves. And the farmer gets upset because those were his pigs. So he goes to the town and tells everybody how mad he is for this dude showing up, ruining his farming business. So they all come out and they beg the son of God to leave. You might be shocked by that statement, but let me tell you something. Churches do it every Sunday. Your hands are up. Your body's there. We're all there. But in the inner part of our throne of our heart, we are sitting on it. So we are telling God, nope, no room here. Please leave. Do you know how many people in that city were sick? Do you know how many people in that region would have had demons that needed to be delivered? Do you know how many people, how many houses would have had issues and problems that the Son of God and His love would have come with compassion and wanted to help them? You begged the, son, you begged the answer to leave. Whew. James 4.13, God owns... Your tithe, he owns your, your money. So the Bible says tomorrow with your time is the first thing God owns, your time. And, 
And he says, why do you say to yourself, you know, I'm going to go here tomorrow and do that tomorrow and have all these plans. He says, that's evil. What you should be saying is if God wills, I'll go there. And if God wills, I'll do that. Why? Because God's the owner of your time. He's the boss of your time. You don't don't get your schedule out in the beginning of 2022 and say, here are all the plans we have and never seek God about it. God does say to make a plan. He said, a man will make his plan, but the Lord orders his step. You see, you got to bring something, a mainframe to the table. You got to bring an outline, but then God is the one who orders all the steps and the timing of every step. And he might switch the step and say, no, nah, not this year. And no, nah, not this month. You see, because if he's the boss, you've given him your time. And so he says, that's evil. If you say in five years, I'm going to be there. And in three years, I'm going to be that. Listen, y'all, you should say, hey, this is the plan. We believe this is what God's been saying. But hey, it's submitted to God all the time. Lord, if you say, because your time belongs to him. The Bible says your possessions belong to him. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. The world and all of its people. And so this is twofold, but let's start with possessions. Do you really think you own your car? Because if you do think it, that's why you won't give people rides to come to a group. And that's why you don't have, the, the car isn't available to pick people up to come to church. And you just ain't got time for that. No, 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 no. But it's not your car. You think you own your house? Because if you do, then you won't have anybody over when you know there's a single mom or somebody who needs something. You could cook a meal for them or you could host somebody or maybe a college student's trying to come in and you could really be an influence. But, you know, we like our space. We like our thing. I get it. I 100%. I understand. you got to have peace. You want to fight for peace in your home. However, it's not your house, so it's God. So you should have that house as a ministry hub. How's God going to use you? Can you cook? I'm telling you, you could use your house. He owns your money. Mark 10, 17 through 31. Not going to read it all. The rich young ruler. Do you remember? Falls at the feet of Jesus. What does he say? What must I do to enter the kingdom of God? He's got all the desire in the world, right? He comes, he's got, he's got everything. He wants it so bad. And Jesus sees his desire and he's like, all right, I, I, I see that you want. They say, just obey all the commandments. He tests him first, right? So he says, which ones? And he says, da, 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 da. And he says, I've done all those. I'm good. And he says, Jesus at that moment realizes that I want to be closer to this man than this man wants to be close to me. Let me say it again. Jesus wants to be closer to you than you want to be closer to him. So Jesus looks at the man and he says, oh, but there's one thing. He looks right into the man's soul. You happen to be in love with money. He sees that. You're in love with it. Nothing wrong with money. The Bible says that there's many prominent women who are rich, rich women who came and followed Jesus the entire time of his ministry, paid for stuff, did it all. The Bible says that when Jesus' body was on the cross and he was there, there was a rich man named Joseph who came and had a tomb, one of his tombs, many places, many properties, and came and took, got his body and put it in one of his tombs. Jesus is not against wealth. Rich people were there. Jesus himself was not poor. Let me, I won't get into this deeper, but let me just say a couple things. Jesus carried his own bank. We know that because Judas was the treasurer and dipped into it all the time, okay? Number two, any, if you, think about, if you're poor, can you, when you're poor, can you do this? They come to him, they put up a coin and they say, uh, pay your taxes. And he tells Peter, he says, oh, okay, give to Caesar what Caesar, he said, just so you won't get offended. Hey, Peter, go get a fishing pole. You don't need any bait. Just go out, throw it right over there. First fish that comes up, we'll have what we need. Give it to the man. That's a poor man. You never are a poor man when by yourself you can feed over 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, in one sitting by yourself. You're not a poor man. All resources were unlimited to Jesus. The only time he became poor was on the cross. He was naked. He had not drank for over 24 to 48 hours. He had not eaten for almost 48 hours. So the shame was on him. His clothes were taken from him. He was clothless, nothing. He became total poverty for us on the cross so that you and I would never have to have the mindset of poverty. But we think it's more Christian to be poor. I'm not going to talk about this. Okay. So he owns your resource. He owns your possessions. How about your children? He said the earth is Lord and everyone in it. All the people belong to him. 
How about Abraham? He knows that he owns Abraham's son, Isaac, so he says, give me your son. Bring him up here on the mountain, kill him. He belongs to me, right? Abraham doesn't question it. Do you see Abraham questioning it? He knows who the owner is. What does he do? He wakes up early the next morning. Crazy father, I couldn't have done this. He doesn't delay at all. He doesn't like say, maybe God will change his mind in two or three days. No. He gets up early the next morning. Why? Because Abraham feared God. And when you fear God, you obey immediately. You don't delay. You see, the fear of the Lord is immediate obedience. Delayed obedience, it's still disobedience. So he obey, he gets up quick. He takes him up to the mountain and right, I mean, he's about to do it. He lifts up the knife, y'all. He's going for it. God, you own this boy. And we do get a little bit of a cheat, though, in Hebrews where it does say, you know, that, that Abraham, when he's up there, God did kind of give him a little cheat move. by he's looking up on the mountain and, and he sees the son of God, literally the crucifixion. He sees Jesus on the mountain in a vision. He goes, whoa. And at that moment, he's given inside himself, oh, if I kill my son, God will just raise him from the dead. So I understand he did have a little bit of a cheat move, but he was still going to kill him. God did give him a little vision, though, to make him feel a little bit better. I love that. I love it how God was like, I know you're doing this for me right now, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I love it. I love it. He's like, I know this is really hard for you. You know why God gave that to Abraham? Obviously for some theological reasons and all that. But can you imagine what Abraham was feeling? Taking his son, knowing he's about to kill him. He's just doing it out of sheer obedience. But God cared so much because Abraham was his friend. So even in his emotional torture and state, he says, I'm going to let you see something real quick. This should make you feel better. I love that. So he goes up there, he picks up the knife. Say, oh, you don't got to do it. You fear God. Why? Because he knew he owned him. How about Hannah? Hannah couldn't have any kids. But the moment she says this, Lord, if you give me a child, I dedicate him to you. He's yours. Okay. Seed. Just wanted you to know, Hannah, who's this going to be? You see, if you feel like you own your kids, you'll talk to them whatever way you think you can. Whatever way you want to. If you feel like you own your kids, you'll, you'll have a certain amount of patience that you think they deserve based on how you feel that day. But if you understand that Jesus, God owns your kids, you're stewarding your children, you'll be careful how you speak. You'll catch yourself before things happen. You'll have more patience. They're not yours. God gave them to you to enjoy. They're a gift to you. Yes, you're their father. Yes, you're their mother. But they have a father. He's entrusting them to you. He entrusted them to you. Do you get the difference? You might just think you procreated them, you tried, and then now they're yours. They're your own. No, no, no. If you think he entrusted them to you, they passed through you, ma'am. They passed through you to live a life of his purpose, not yours. He entrusted you. He loved you so much. Think about your kids, how much you love them. God loves you so much that, yes, he gave them to you as a gift, but number two, he chose to trust you with them. They're his, but he believed that you would be fit for the job, even though maybe you didn't even think you were ready yet. He looked at you, mom, and he looked at you, dad. And you should remember this. Anytime you're having issues and feeling like you're failing as a mother or a father, God looked at you first, and he says, I know they can do it. They're perfect. So as much as you think you're failing, God already approved of you as parents. Man, it touches me. He owns your money, Haggai 2.8. So remember this. If you're not tithing, just a quick little thing, beginning, you're not even beginning for God to own your money because that's a, that's a command. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It, you know, uh, tithing is a matter of obedience. Giving is a matter of the heart. Giving has to do with your heart. Tithing has nothing to do with your heart. Tithing just has to do whether you obey or not. It's cursed or it's not. It's that simple. And remember, Jesus doesn't need your money, just so you know. He's trying to get you to tithe so you don't need your money. Jesus doesn't need your money, but he's trying to get you to tithe so that you don't need your money. That's why you have to do it weekly. Do it weekly because you're continuously telling yourself, this does not rule me. I can give this away freely. I'm not worried. God's my provider. That's what you tell yourself every time you do it. You need to do it for yourself to heal yourself, to heal your worry and anxiety. And, and, and as a matter of fact, in, in giving, just so you'll know as well, if you want to get out of debt, you don't save your way out of debt in the kingdom. You need to save. You need to be smart. All that. Let God speak to you about all that. Joseph did it. It's a smart thing. Just, okay, 
What I'm saying is you give your weight out of, out of debt in the kingdom. Remember, he provides seed to sowers. He doesn't provide seed to people who are sitting watching people sow. You hear what I said? He provides seed to sowers. He didn't provide seed to people sitting watching people sow. If you want to have more seed going through your hand, you have to sow more seed. You sow your way out of debt. You sow your way into becoming the greatest giver you could have ever imagined. I say this to churches everywhere, and I'll only say this once. Here, because I don't want to get into it, but this does mess with people. But please understand where I'm coming from. You are selfish as a Christian if you do not want to be a millionaire. You're selfish if you don't want to be a millionaire. Gavin, what are you talking about? Well, there's over 150 kids that we have in Casa Helena in Guatemala. These kids have been through every kind of abuse, been through every kind of pain you can think about. If they would tell their stories, one story would floor this entire place under the power and presence of God because of what he's done, because none of us could imagine it. Do you know what got him out of those places of abuse? Money. Do you know what now over 103 widows that we built homes for and that we feed every single day? We bring the food. We, have, we take doctors up there. We have their medical every single month until they go to heaven. We put stoves in. You know what built those people's prayers? Yeah. Money. Do you know what built the over 30-something acres now that now we just received our first million-dollar check last year to build a hospital for a surgery clinic now to take care of cleft palates? You know, a million-dollar check. You know what that is? It's called money. Do you know that now we have a place that we're going to be able to have our own hotel above the orphanage that when our teams come, we don't have to just go at all the other. We're going to have our own hotel to treat them well and treat them and do the whole thing right next to the orphanage now on top of a mountain, one of the most beautiful seniors you're ever going to see. How did that happen? Somebody gave so in other words, if you are so afraid of greed and all those things, I, I get it. You should deal with God or whatever if you're afraid you're going to have money. However, you're thinking too small. When you start realizing the need and the power of giving somebody their dream with your pen, you're going to want God to use you. Because if he doesn't give it to you, he's going to give it to people in the world. Because even people in the world many times give better than people in church. Because even people in the world know that supporting orphans and widows and the poor is a good thing to do. Don't be afraid of it. Don't, don't make money religious. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's if it controls you. But remember, tithing and giving keep the control away from you. As long as you're a tither and you're a giver, I promise it's not going to touch you. That's your protection. God will tell you to give again if you're getting weird about things and trying to, he's like, oh, no, no, give, I promise you. The moment, he knows what's going on in your heart. And the moment you start getting it, he'll be like, give it, give it away. Oh, he's rescuing you. He's rescuing you from going to hell <laughs> because of the greed that could destroy your life. I, I promise. But he wants you to have it. He wants to give it to you. Can you uh, play that track for me in the back? Just play that for me real quick. Read this last scripture. Is anybody since God in here? Feel the presence of the Lord on this. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. If you'll just trust in God's plans, he's a great owner. He knows how to give you the best. He wants you to have the best. His plans for you are only good, and his plans for you are only hope. He still believes in you even if you don't believe in yourself. Mother, father, he believes in you. I want to tell you that first. Daughter, son, he believes in you. But in order for all of the authority and power and resources of heaven to come to your aid, there needs to be one person on the throne. His name is the Holy Spirit. God gave him to us. Jesus said, it's better that I go away so that he can come. He left us with a great owner. He left us with a great landlord. He knows what he's doing. He's been around. Never forget this. The same Holy Spirit that's inside of you that I'm talking to every single one of you. Look into your eyes. 
the same one that's inside of you was first beating inside of the chest of Jesus. He was in the chest of Jesus. Telling Jesus what to do. Guiding him through every situation in his life. Every situation that could have been stressful, potential, coming against him, temptations. He was there to help. Jesus didn't give you a different spirit. He gave you the same one. He's way older than you are. He's been around for a long, long, long time. He's been through every type of depression. He's been through every type of situation. He's seen every kind of temptation come to every kind of person. He's been through every war. He's been through every peace. He's been in the midst of every trial. He's been in the chests of people for thousands and thousands of years, getting them through every potential crisis and turning it into a masterpiece of a life. He's done it before. Your problems are not too big for him. Your issues are not too hard for him. You can trust him. I want everybody to close their eyes real quick. And I want you to ask yourself this question. I ask people to ask the same question all over the world. Every time you hear a sermon, you should ask yourself this question. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Sermons are preached, many words are spoken, it's heard for everybody. But I guarantee you, there was a voice behind my voice this morning. There was a voice that was speaking to you about something specific for your personal life. That's what you need to know. If it was one line, maybe it was one point, maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't even a point that I said, but the Holy Spirit came through something else and He dropped something in your spirit in this morning while you were sitting in that seat. And I want you to know that that is the most important thing in your life right now what he said is your priority what he said is everything it's worth changing all your plans about it's it's worth shifting anything about that word he said because he's getting you into a position where he can sit on the throne again and that is the next step whatever he's saying to you right now he's saying it clearly i believe he's speaking all over this room right now and as he's speaking to you listen listen to it listen to it that is the next step for getting into in place where all of the resources of heaven will come to you lord we love you we thank you jesus what is he saying to you now as you hear what he's saying to you here's the next step i want you right now inside of your heart to dedicate that you actually have the intention to do what he says. You see, the reason why I say this is because so many times God speaks to us in church, but we don't actually intend before we leave on changing. We say, oh, the conviction, the presence that's in the moment is so beautiful. And we sit under the weight of his glory, but we don't actually have the intention. Our minds should be turning right now. Your mind should be turning about how you're going to shift your plans or what is it about your home or how you're spending your time or what is that? You need to actually be shifting in your mind right now. How am I going to change this? Because I intend on not just listening to it, but doing the word, not just listening to it, but doing the word. You see, if you just listen and don't do, you're like a person who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets but if you'll do what he's telling you right now there's something you can change something I promise he's not going to be telling you something so hard that it's going to take the entire rest of your life he's going to be telling something that he will help you with he's going to be telling you something right now that he will walk you through he's not going to leave you alone in doing it when he tells you his word it's because he intends on walking it through with you you will have a companion you will be helped You will not be alone, but he needs you to actually intentionally say, I'm going to change. I'm going to do this in your heart right now. Are you turning your heart toward him? Are you turning your intentions toward him? Is your heart set? God, I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have a conversation with my wife after church today. We're going to change this. I'm going to have a conversation with my husband. I'm going to do this. We're we're, we're going to talk through this. This is not going to be another Sunday. Holy Spirit, you're coming right now. You're speaking to me. You are the Lord. I want your resources in my life. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Now, real quick, before we move on to the next step, Jesus is already moving. I'm feeling him speak to different things. I'm about to say in just a moment, he's already beginning to move for this place. I want to say two things. Number one, please come tonight. If you're able to come to Owatonna, please come. We're going to have a healing service, a healing service specifically for sick bodies and sick hearts. We're having a healing service. If you know anybody who needs that, please come. Number two, are you sure that you're going to heaven? 
do you know without the shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven before I move on? God's about to give some words to a couple people, but before I move on, I want to ask you, do you know for sure? If you are not sure, do you, we, it's not going to be anything crazy that's going to go on. But in this moment right now, God is watching. Jesus is here. He wants to enter into your life. If you have never accepted Jesus or you have at one point, but you're like, Jesus isn't my priority. I've turned away from the Lord, but I'm ready to turn back right now. I want you to raise your hand right where you're at, unashamed. Say, I, I've received him, but I, I just, I need to, I need to rededicate. I need to, I need to give my focus back to the Lord right now. He has not been my priority. He's not been on the throne of my heart. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Or if you say, you know what? I've never prayed that prayer. Lift that hand right now. Unashamed. Nobody's looking around. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, praise God. And Jesus, we just love you, Lord. Now let's just pray all together right now. I'm going to say a prayer. You all repeat after me. Let's just do this right now. This is the most important prayer. God saw you lift your hand. He's looking at your heart. Make sure you say this out loud. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying for me. On the cross for my sin. Thank you that your blood washed my sins away. Thank you for making me clean. I need you to be my boss. I turn over ownership of my life, of my plans, of my time, and I will become a true disciple. I dedicate to discipleship. Say it again. I dedicate to discipleship to become a disciple of Jesus. Thank you for loving me. I'm not guilty anymore. I'm not guilty anymore. But I'm made brand new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. That's so beautiful. Give him a hand real quick. Give him a hand real quick. <laughs> ma'am and sir, just right here is sitting there. You have a watch that's glowing, ma'am, just right there. Okay? Yeah, if you guys want to stand, that's totally fine. You can stay in your seats as well with me. I don't require you to stand if you don't want to, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm seeing right now there's a deep pool. And the pool, it looks like, is going 10 foot deep. But then I see that there's a whole nother 10 feet. And then as I'm looking, there's a whole nother 10 feet. Then as I'm looking, and I keep looking down, and as the water's getting deeper, the water is getting, uh, it's getting uh, darker because the deeper it gets, the blue gets darker. And I just see like it's a well that's going down deep, 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 deep inside. And it's almost like never ending. And so I'm, I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, does it end right now? And I feel he's responding to me and he's just telling me, he's saying the only one who can tell them when it stops is them, but I've never meant for it to stop. There's an endless well, and I feel this is wisdom that's also in your life. I feel this is knowledge, but there's also some other things you both have been praying and seeking God about. And I feel like there have been restraints and limits that have been put, and I feel like a couple of these things are people that you've prayed for as well. And there have been a certain declaration of limitations on these people as well as yourselves. But Jesus said, if you won't agree with them, I don't. Just keep going down get lost in my presence get lost in my word keep worshiping me the way you know how do what I tell you to do I will never ever let the limitations stop anyone you love or yourselves for your destiny thank you God I feel Jeremiah 29 11, the thoughts and the plans I've always had for you before either one of you were formed in your mother's womb were always thoughts of good but he said the thoughts I had for you went past you and they went to your children and they went to the people that you love he said, I'm taking care of everything. I got you in the palm of my hand. He said, I've written both your names on my hand. He said, I can see it throughout the day. I know what you're going through. Anything that's happening in your mind or your hearts. And ma'am, I specifically just want to pray for you if you'll allow me. I want to pray for you for your sleep and your rest. And I want to pray that there's a spirit of peace that comes over you that truly passes all your understanding, ma'am. And that any stress or anything that could be touching you right now, I just pray it come off in the name of Jesus. So I just agree by the power of the Holy Spirit that you receive that right now. I think that anxiety is no longer a part of your life. That there is nothing that can twist you to and fro. You've been trying to believe. You've been trying to stand firm. And some days you feel like you did a good job. Other days you feel like you did terrible. And I just feel like God's like, listen. If you'll know I'm a rock, I don't shift. You can have all your, he said, just have your, have your feelings. Go through it with me. I'm not shifting, so don't feel like you are. I'm not shifting, so don't feel like you are. You can go through your emotions with me. Do your ups and downs. Cry it out. Shout it out. 
happy, joyful. I'm not shifting as long as you look back to me. So don't feel like you are. Somebody else needed that word that I just said. Praise God. Bless you both. Sir, as well, the fi- the, uh, your devotional time, sir, he's about to visit you. When you open up the Bible, it's been precious to you. But I'm telling you, there's going to be like fire coming off of the page. He's going to arrest you. You're going to read a certain amount of scripture, and then you're going to have to stop because you're going to start weeping. Because God's going to touch your heart so deeply, you're not going to be able to continue. Because his word, the Bible says there's many levels of the word. There's the milk, there's the meat, the strong meat. But there's also many more levels of the word the Bible talks about. It talks about that there's the oil. It talks about that there's the wine. And it talks about there's the honey. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to take you into the secret, deeper levels of the word of God, where every word you read literally is so amazing to your taste. You're not going to want to leave. You're going, oh, my God. And it's going to satisfy you so deeply, sir. So deeply. You're going to feel so fulfilled in God's word. And I just, that's just a gift to you. But God eventually is doing it for you because you're going to speak it out of your own mouth. There are men that you need to speak to. There are people in your life as well that you need to speak to. He's going to use your mouth for some beautiful things. Don't worry about the timing of it all. Just begin to enjoy Jesus in a beautiful way, okay? Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Right here, my man. What's your name? Philip? Phil. What up, Phil? Hey, man, so I see both of your feet, right? I see that they're running, and they're running really, really, really fast, right? You're extremely hungry for God. You have an extreme uh, desire to run for God and all that. And God says, listen, he said, as fast as you're running, he says, I'm about to kick up the speed. He said, I'm about to send sparks. I see sparks coming off of your feet because you're going to be going so fast that almost the ground underneath you can't even see it because you're going to be eating the word literally like food. He says, I want you to begin to eat the word in the morning, in the noon, and in the nighttime. Every physical meal you have God told me this years ago I've never shared this with anybody else but I'm sharing it with you because he's saying the same thing every physical meal I have I also take a spiritual meal I'm challenging you to do the exact same thing every time you eat a physical meal read just a little bit of the word or memorize the scripture say it a few times and do it physical meal and a spiritual meal because God's saying I'm honing you right now because I have a lot of things but if I told you right now you'd go for them but you don't have the tact and the wisdom yet in order to handle it but I'll teach you into doing it and he said just trust me be, get, keep running eat the word be 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 tenacious be crazy about it everything listen to word all day long anytime you're in your car it's only the word anytime you're the word the word the word okay because he's literally preparing you you're going to be a man who goes to multiple countries you're going to be a man who goes to multiple uh hemispheres of the earth all over the earth i see that you're going to speak multiple languages as well sir um i see that you're going to have a hand that's going to be incredible with orphans that are going to be all over the world but you're going to also be involved with hospitals with businesses you're going to have um, people that that trust you even though they don't trust the places they'll put millions of dollars through your hands sir as you take them into places where God's heart is beating. And I just see that so powerfully for you, sir. Never, never, ever, never feel like anything you've ever done is disqualified. You're not good enough. You're not behind. I feel like God wants you to hear that as well. You're not behind. You're exactly where he wants you to be. You sat on this road today because God wanted to tell you all these things. Do you receive it? Bless you, Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness gracious. God is so good. Ma'am right here, lady right here. Woo, you got a beautiful bow in your hair. Yes, yes, hallelujah. God bless you. Um, I do need to know your name. What's your name? Marshantia. Marshantia. Okay. Tia. Shia. Marshantia. Okay. <sighs> Praise God. Marshantia. I got to tell you a couple of things. I see you laying on a bed. Okay. You're laying on the bed and you've tapped out. I said, don't tap out. It's not over. You've laid on the bed and you've tapped out. Like, Lord, I can't get up. I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to go there again. I, I, and I can't help but get emotional, man, because I feel like I'm feeling just maybe a touch of what you're going through right now. And I just want to say, God, I, I'm so sorry for the things and the feeling that you're feeling right now. I, I just, I, my heart is breaking for you right now, ma'am. But God is not without the resources to give you the life that you still have prayed and believe you're supposed to have. Okay? So remember this. Never forget this picture. It says that Jesus walked up to Lazarus' tomb and he was crying. And it says, as he was weeping, he called out to Lazarus. The weeping Jesus called out, get up and rise, Lazarus. So Jesus is telling me, he said, it's no big, he said, you can cry. He said, emotions are not something that scares me. Emotions aren't something that comes against me. But he says, even in the midst of emotions, I want you to reignite faith. I want you to reignite faith. You just need one word. 
Just trust me, I'll give you the word. Stand on it with all of your strength. And I promise I'll take you every single step out of the pit you feel like you're in. And you feel it's very, very deep. You've actually said to yourself, I don't think there's hope in this area or this area. You've been, you've been, your hope has been very destroyed and crushed, ma'am. That's why I'm seeing you. It feels like you've tapped out. You said, Lord, you know, I love you. You're, you're awesome. Um, but just for me, I just, I can't do this anymore. Jesus has given you a fresh wind. And I see him now coming under you, laying on that bed. And as you would lay on a mattress, I see he is the one you're laying on now. He took the mattress out and he's coming underneath you right now. And he's putting himself underneath you and he stretched out in the form of the cross because he's saying the cross is what you lay on this is beautiful he's saying the cross is now going to take the place of as you would lean on something like a bed or something for comfort he says find comfort in what i did for you find comfort in the cross because the cross is the strongest mattress i've never said this to anybody it's the strongest mattress you can ever lay on it's beautiful it's for you. He came for you today. Shantia, he loves you with all of his heart. He's not given up on your future. Nothing that this world can do from, for you or to you can ever take you and snatch you out of his hand. So I just want you to receive his love today. And I want hope to reignite in you in the name of Jesus. Just know he pointed you out because he loves you. He saw you in the midst of all these people. Not everybody's going to get a word this morning, but you did. Because he saw you. Amen. God bless. Ma'am, all the way in the back. All the way in the back. Right behind you, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Right. Can you? Yep. Yeah, right. You're looking the other way. All the way. Yeah, yes. That's, that's you. Yes. Yes. That's you. Yes, ma'am. Um, just want to tell you something. Your prayers are very important to God. He has you on a strategic mission right now. Uh, and he's telling you specifically to not only say prayers, write prayers. And he's saying, uh, get specific missions through prayer for certain people in this church and people that you're already praying for. He's saying that you need to become mission minded when it comes to prayer because I'm using your voice. He says, and he's telling me to tell you, many people pray, but not everybody knows the power of prayer. He says, so because they don't know the power of prayer and they do pray, even though I'm listening, I can't use it because it's not mixed with faith. So he's saying, but you, however, have a belief and faith in prayer. And he's saying, I'm going to ignite that even stronger. And he says, what I do with people who know how to pray is those are the ones who change the earth. So the earth, all the political structures, everything in the earth has only changed because certain people, the few that God knows that know the power of prayer are what shifts it. We think politics change the earth. It's prayer that changes it. We think that, you know, some people randomly get in place. No, God is the one. He's doing all this that's going on. It's the prayers of people. It's the prayer people who are the ones who shape the course of our world. When people stop praying, that's when evil rises higher than it ever has. When people begin praying, that's when God becomes and flourishes again. And he's saying, you're one of the people. Become mission-minded. Write down the names of the people. The moment you see them, he said, the way that you'll know is you'll look at them and you'll feel a burden in your heart. There'll be something that hits you. You won't know how to describe it, but the burden will touch you. Write their names down. Find out their names. You don't even have to tell them everything you're praying for them about, but begin to do it. And then we watching their lives, watching their lives. Look for opportunity because God's using you on a mission, ma'am. You're about to have the most fulfilling years you've ever had. I don't know how old you are, ma'am, but you're about to have the most fulfilling years you've ever had because these next years, God is saying, I'm giving you a brand new ministry. Maybe you felt like, you know, maybe it's just time, you know, for whatever I do now as I do in my age, but that's not the way Jesus sees it. He always has something for us to do. That's why if we tap out before the time he tells us to, he's always sad <laughs> because until you go to heaven, there are things that you need to be used for. You just need to find out what's next. And I tell that to every elderly person in this building. I don't know what you think because you, if you retire from a normal job, just know you never retire from ministry. So there's still something God wants you to do, and it might be more than what you're doing right now. You just seek him again. I promise he wants to tell you something. So, man, be blessed with that. Also, as well, I feel like your nervous system as well as your blood flow. I'm praying for your blood flow right now and your nervous system. There's also, I see uh, in your right hip and the small of your back down here on the right side of your back. Um, I feel like any achiness or any problems that are going to happen, anything you might be having with your back, I see that there's swelling as well. Every once in a while, that begins to form in your feet. And I just hear God say, I'm going to reorganize and just touch you right now. Do you mind just lifting your hands, ma'am, and receiving that? By the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' precious holy name, 
be touched from your head to your toes all the way down. Uh, I, there's something that happened to your vocal cords many, many years ago. God is touching your throat. In Jesus' precious holy name, I thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Your eyesight as well, ma'am. I think that God's going to make your eyesight younger than it's ever been in Jesus' name. So God bless you and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot that's going on back there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just a couple more. Is this all right today? Is this all right today? Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, real quick, right over here. Boop. Your fireball, right here. Bah. You, you sing up here, worship. Yes, ma'am. Your fireball, you're amazing. Just want to tell you something real quick, okay? I hear him saying, promises occupied. That's what he's telling you. It's time for promises occupied. The rest of this year, all 2023, all 22, uh, 24, uh, 2024, uh, and all the way to 2025. Uh, Promises occupied. You'll pray it. God will have it. Some of them before you pray it. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Sir, right here, man, with the coat on. You're awesome, bro. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you're looking both ways. Yeah, you right there. Don't, don't worry, man. You have to stand up. Tell me anything. What's going on? I just want to tell you, man, um, there's an education process that's happening for you. You're a student right now you're a student in many ways but you're a student and god wants to make you his disciple so when he went and called his disciples all he did was he walked by and he said follow me it's that they immediately dropped whatever they were doing and they followed him i'm going to tell you why in the jewish culture when a rabbi every single kid the best job you could have in Jewish culture is to be under a rabbi. It's better than owning a business or anything else. So every child until they're 12 years old is memorizing the entire Old Testament. Okay, so all of the five books, they memorize it by heart. And they're trying to constantly look at rabbis and they have certain ones they want to be under. And so they come and they get tested at 12 years old. And the rabbi will ask them multiple different questions. You know, can you quote all of Deuteronomy 28 to me? Or can you quote da, 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 da. And they'll just have all these things and the kid will have to do it. Okay. So when that happens, if the rabbi chooses them at the end, he only will choose one. And he'll say, follow me, eat my dust. That's what he says. Follow me, eat my dust. So understand that every single one of the disciples that Jesus called were over 12 years old. Most of them were in their upper teens. Matthew was around 23 to 25 is what they be believe. Okay, so, so get this. They already missed their opportunity. They didn't get chosen. The statement, follow me, eat my dust, means this. I believe you can be me. So that's why they want it, because I believe you can be me. So when the rabbi would say that to the kid, the parents would be, <gasps> because he could be them. Prominent, prominent person in society. So Jesus came to them. They'd already been passed up. They didn't beat the test for the rabbi. But a rabbi came and said, follow me. I believe you can be me. They dropped their nets automatically and left because they knew it was the best thing they could ever be offered. And all I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is because Jesus is offering. He wants you with your heart to willingly enroll. Okay? That's going to mean some discipleship. It's going to mean some changes in your life. He's going to tell you what those are. That's going to mean some things that you're going to have to really focus on. Some things you're focused on right now that you're going to have to readdress with God. Go there, get a pen paper out, get some time with the Lord, let him do it. But you need to become a disciple of Jesus. He has plans for your life. Okay? There are overseas things as well that you're going to do. Plans for your life. All right? So just take the first step. I just want to tell you, you're a student. If you'd like to enroll, he's passing by you right now. He's asking. Follow me. Okay? Bless you. One more. One more. And then tonight, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot more, okay? We're, we're going to flow a lot tonight, I promise, but specifically for healing as well, the body and everything else. But I wanted to get you guys out of here by 12 o'clock, so it's 11.58. So, um, and thank you so much, Pastor Tyler and Jessica, for giving me the freedom to do this. I know you guys are used to maybe an hour and 15, so I hope 45 minutes wasn't too much longer for you guys. But, uh, okay, I, I, got, I have so many words I want to give, but I'm just going to give it to you guys right here. Bam, in the pink. What's your name? What? Kathy. Okay. And your husbands? Okay. Kevin. Kevin and Kathy. Okay. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Trying to hear. Lord, super my hearing. Um, wanted to tell you guys that uh, your hands have always been open and God is proud of you. That's what I first want to say. Your hands have been open and God is proud of you because when he puts something in your hands, you let it flow. That's all he's wanted everybody's hands to be. It's an open hand so that when he puts it in, it can flow through you to someone else. So you guys have been incredible at that. Now he's saying, I'm going to up it 10 times. So you guys have already incredible, but he's saying, I'm going to give you 10 times the seed because I know you're 10 times the sower you are right now. I'm going to make it for you. 
I'm going to do it for you right now. The fulfillment you guys are about to have in your life, you have never tasted to this point. Because the fulfillment you'll have of seeing other people blessed through your hands and your giving and the things God's going to put inside of you, it's going to make you so happy. You're going to feel like you could just go to heaven. You're going to have heaven on earth because you both are truly fulfilled when you bless someone else. And that's such a great heart. That's what God's always wanted. The truest fulfillment you can have is in giving. It's not in receiving. And you both have already accepted that. You both know it. Now, in the midst of that, God's going to take care of a couple financial things that you guys already have that's on your mind. Um, He's going to take care of um, some specific resources that you guys need in some other areas. Uh, I see that there's a girl. Uh, I don't, it looks like a younger girl. I don't know who this girl is, but I see it's someone that you care about. And I see that God has uh, put her on your hearts. I don't know if this, I don't know if it's a relative or what it is. I'm trying to hear the Holy Spirit, but I just know that there's a specific person. You've prayed for this individual. God says, she's in my hands. It's all taken care of. I'm completely going to take care of these people. There's multiple people as well. Sir, you have people that you pray for all the time that you see and they're like, man, they need Jesus. They need help, (laughs) you know, and your heart is just so open and all that. And uh, I just feel God just saying, I listen to every single one. Please stand in the gap. Be there. God's using you as an instrument to do all those things. That makes sense? Sir, is there any um, is there any physical issues you have of any kind? Are you just healthy as a board? Praise God. Ma'am, how about you as well? I just want to get you guys to get healthy in every area. Okay, this is so incredible. All right, so that must mean this. All right, let me take your right hand. If you don't mind, I'm just going to pray for you. Just agree with your right hand. I put healing in your hands in Jesus' name that you guys can transfer healing to more people in your life than ever before. Physical healing, healings of the heart. You will have the ministry of healing everywhere you go. Broken hearts, broken bodies being healed under your hands. He's going to give you the boldness. He's going to give you the words to say the moment you open your mouth just like he says to his disciples he said don't worry about what will be there just open them and i'll fill them and in jesus name i thank you lord their ministry of healing is beginning today in jesus name bless you guys thank you lord bless you guys thank you so much awesome y'all i thank you so much for your time this morning man it's been amazing i feel like there's a beautiful peace here incredible presence of the spirit of god who wants the lord to take over do you need his help with anything Yeah, (laughs) if he's the boss, don't call him Lord and don't do what he says. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but I'll tell you this. When your heart is turned to this direction and he gets on it, when you do fail, when you do try to take control, you know it right away. You repent and you move on. But there's some people in here that really needed to know if you'll just let go of control, God will take control. This is a people's kids. Some of y'all need to hear this. As long as you preach and you're the only one preaching to your children, God can't. As long as your hands are the only ones on it, you must let go so God can put his hands on. Trust him. He's a good savior. He loves your kids more than you do. He loves your families more than you do. And I just believe there's so many needs. And I hope to see you all tonight, honestly, in Owatonna. Please come. It's going to be a miraculous experience. There's going to be healed bodies tonight in beautiful, incredible ways. And I just thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Young man like myself, being able to have the pulpit, I never take it for granted. This is the gospel of Jesus, and I'm so honored to be able to carry it. So I hope you were blessed. God bless. We want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make that choice and have that assurance that you're saved and going to heaven, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be the perfect and final sacrifice for all my sins. Today I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me righteous. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, we'd love to send you a free gift all about your choice to follow Jesus. Simply email us at the link below with your email address. It's time now to give in our tithes and offerings. We want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 that God provides seed to the sower. Keep sowing that seed and God will keep providing seed to sow. There are four ways that you can give. You can give online through our website. You can give through texting on your phone. You can give through our Destiny app and set it up to be automated. And you can give by mail. Thanks again for your generosity. We pray that God bless it and multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen.